Hey guys, so now that I have most of the easy panels from chapter six sketched out, and I did a few of those for you, but I did a lot more of them. Um, let me fix that, or try to at least. My, my gooseneck clamp is getting kind of loose. Um, now that I have a lot of the easier panels sketched out, um, I am going to want to go through page by page and do the perspective for the panels that are not, <laughs> that are a little bit harder or would be harder to guess or would look awful if I guessed. Um, and some of these panels are actually easy panels that can be filled in once the, pers the panels that require perspective have been filled in because it's going to give me a better idea of what I need. And some of these panels I skip because I need to take uh, reference photos of the action so I can better draw it. So today I'm going to do a super easy page and do the cover and it's got um, Naomi, the human girl that Kara's friends with, reading a book with her cat Pancake while eating junk foodie snacks. And the way I'm going to do this is, um, and I may not actually be able to do it at my table because I use really big rulers is I'm going to take some scrap pieces of scratch pieces of paper just um, like printer misprints or you know the backs of things I'm no longer using and I'm going to tape those around to make my actual page large enough for me to accomplish what I to accomplish what I need to accomplish and let me find my white masking tape because that's another one of the tools I'm going to use. I'm going to try to get you guys started on here and then possibly change my work environment to something that's actually comfortable for me because doing this at the table is going to be very uncomfortable. So first we're going to uh, surround the image with um, sheets of like a uh, scratch paper. And this is a little bit difficult for me because I'm still not working at full capacity. And I like to use white um, masking tape or white drafting tape, sort of the low tack stuff, because um, you don't want when you, this is not a permanent thing. When you're finished doing the, the panel or the page, you want to be able to very easily remove your extra paper and your tape and you don't want it tearing up your page. And that, I mean, you do still get some tearing. So just be careful, as careful as you can be when you're removing the tape. So I'm going to finish this and I'm going to get back to you guys. Okay, so sorry about my current mess. Let me get that fixed up. While I was, um, or right after I had finished taping my paper, my camera rig decided it was time to fall down. So I spent like 20 minutes fixing it. It's always an adventure here. And by adventure, I often mean kind of miserable annoyance. So, all right, I have all four sides of the paper taped down. And this is just like your basic setup if you want to lay out a perspective grid by hand. There are plenty of other ways you can do it, including using Manga Studio in Photoshop. I'm just showing you the kind of old-fashioned way um, because this is a way that's pretty much accessible to anyone as long as they have a long ruler. And I have longer rulers than this. They just won't fit on my desk. So um, what you want to do with this kind of a grid is you kind of want to get a feel for where your horizon line is going to be or you want to determine your horizon line. So I think the horizon line in this one is probably... Mm, probably right here and um, you may end up having to attach additional pieces of paper Let's see if I can get my camera up anymore you may have to attach additional pieces of paper to give yourself the space you need to do the perspective grid you need and now that I'm looking at it um, maybe a little higher up So I'm going to use my trusty non-photo blue mechanical pencil, which is um, a color Eno, a Pilot Color Eno size 7. 
filled with col uh, Pilot Color Eno size 7 lead in soft blue. And as you can see, it's breaking a lot. It, uh, oh, sorry about that. That's a horrible noise. It tends to want to like, um, I'm drawing on a glass tabletop right now against a hard metal surface. It's not a great scenario for your... And it already looks like I'm going to have to tape additional pieces of paper to this, which is going to make doing it on camera for you guys really annoying and difficult. That's okay. I love you guys. Should be worth it. So I'm going to tape, tape, tape. Let me see if I can get more stuff off my desk. I'm going to tape the next sheet long ways because it'll give me a little more room to work. And I'm going to lay my ruler down again and ex continue extending my line until it is long, until I feel like it's probably going to be long enough. Um, some of this is unfortunately just the year, the result of years of doing comics, laying out perspective grids this way. So some of the stuff I do now is because I kind of have a feel for what I need, not which makes it, it makes it hard, I know, for you guys who are still learning, because it's just like, well, you'll get a feel for it, and you will. It takes, it takes time. You guys don't know how many, um, panels I've just had to completely erase over the years because I set my grid up wrong. And it looks like my ruler might not really be long enough. This should be okay. And um, something that sometimes happens, especially when you're working one-handed, kind of, is your ruler can slip because you're not providing adequate pressure. So um, keep that in mind. This ruler has a foam backing on it, which is supposed to prevent it from slipping, but over the years that foam backing has kind of oxidized and gotten hard, so it doesn't work as well as it should. And let's find our other vanishing point, which is fortunately kind of close, so I don't have to tape, like, well, almost at six sheets of paper, but not quite at six sheets of paper. So, you can, maybe you can see from here that these, this is wrong, but I, this shelf right here is wrong, but I had guessed that, you know? Um, that was just me trying to jot out thumbnails as quickly as I could while still being somewhat accurate. Um, the more you do this, the better you'll be at being able to gauge where things should go. I'm still, it's been a few months since I've drawn my own comic pages. I've been doing illustrations for other people, which do require perspective lines, but I haven't, but illust standalone illustrations don't require as many perspective lines per page as, um, as a comic page would, just because there's more illustrations per page. So doing comics will certainly help you get good practice. So what I'm doing is I'm basically going to, and oh, you guys can't see this, I'm really sorry. This, there's just like not a very optimal way to do this. Um, it's very faint because it's non-photo blue, but I'm basically drawing lines radiating from the two, um, the two vanishing points on my horizon line. And I actually like to mark my horizon line in case I have to make corrections later. I mark it with HL, horizon line. And I'll tell you, drawing on top of my blue lines, I used to try and recreate, I had like a really different comic process when I was in SCAD because I was trying to do um, what my teacher was showing us, how he did it, and it just didn't work for me. I needed different steps. So um, what I did then is I would try to recreate everything 
with no underdrawing. And it just took me so long to get pages done because I was drawing everything without any sort of a blueprint over and over and over and over again and getting progressively frustrated because it was took so long and it was so hard for me to do. And then one of my professors showed us, I think it was Anthony Fisher, showed us how to change like your thumbnails to non-photo blue and then you print that out at a larger size and then, you know, you work with that as your guideline and it's so much easier to do it this way. And I have a very old tutorial on my blog on how to change your sketch to blue lines and I really need to do another one. Although the process hasn't changed much, my art sure has. And I also think people don't necessarily check my archives, which is a shame because there's a lot of really good information there even if the art's improved over the years. I wrote a lot about what I was being taught at SCAD or what was being taught to me at SCAD at the time. So um, while it's not the same as paying for an art school education, it's a cheap education on things taught in an art school. So you could maybe go in more prepared than I did. And I'm just having trouble with the glass surface of my desk and keeping my ruler in place kind of one-handed and being enough on video that you guys can see what I did. And you want to kind of draw your non-photo blue lines faintly because otherwise this is going to end up a mess and you really don't want to draw it in graphite because then it will really turn into a mess. And it'll get all over the place. This cover also kind of has a lot going on because there's um, chapter information text. Oh, and the way I think I'm going to handle that is I think I'm going to letter that on a separate sheet of paper and um, combine the two in Photoshop before I do my penciled blue lines. So if your ruler isn't long enough to reach from your far horizon line, um, it's okay to just draw some preliminary lines that do reach your um, vanishing point as far as you can and then continue them later by moving your your ruler and the easier way to do that is to just go ahead oh I'm sorry and just radiate your ruler around your vanishing point That squeaking noise is terrible. My apologies. I'm sure it's worse on camera. It's pretty bad in real life. And I'm sorry. Um, it's hard to see. The light I have for my table is good for most recordings doesn't really help illuminate the whole desk though so I try to work within the circle of light for the most part for your convenience and my own And this can end up taking a really long time. Um, I tend to stick to fairly simple perspective grids for my comics, um, mostly because I would rather just focus on telling the story than doing um, complicated backgrounds. But even with simple perspective, two-point perspective, maybe three if I'm feeling really feisty. Um, if you have a page where you have six panels and all of them 
need perspective grids. It can take a really long time, and I've done that to myself. I've drawn pages where I had every panel required me to to sit down and hash out the perspective grid. Um, and that's where programs like Manga Studio can make doing your perspective a lot easier because they have like these um, radial vanishing point kind of things. I'll have to demonstrate it for you guys at some point. But I wanted to be able to show you guys the method that really anybody, anybody with a ruler and some tape and some scrap paper can do. And there are plenty of great resources online which can explain how to do perspective grids. And I think I have um, kind of a shabby post from years ago about doing them. Getting really tired of this lip raging. I'm gonna have to come up with a good environment for recording comic page process. I really would like to be able to share that with you guys because comics are the bulk of what I do. Um, and not being able to share it means you guys don't realize what I'm working on. Okay, so I have my grid all, sorry about the shadow, all laid out. You can still faintly see the characters. If at this point you want to get rid of your, your paper, you, you totally can. Um, I'm going to keep it because it helps me, um, <laughs> it helps prevent me from being too confused. Oh, and I need to reference Naomi's new outfit. So I go back to that sketchbook I had when I was doing easy panels. And that's her outfit. And I can even switch to a smaller ruler. Um, let me see if I can find one. I'm really reliant on that big Aluma Cutter ruler, but it does get in the way. I used to have a small plastic T-square that would be just about perfect if I can find it. I'll tell you what, I'm going to pause it and find it and get back to you guys. So while I was digging for rulers, which I did find, I actually found a lot of other comic tools that um, I was talked into buying. Um, and I don't use them very often, but they might be useful for you. So, um, kind of ironic that the tool, okay. So first is a compass, like the sort you used for high school math um, or high school geometry class, used for drawing circles, still relevant still useful this one was very cheap i think i got it from like a grocery store like a kroger it has um a pencil clasp which isn't um big enough to hold a mechanical pencil oh shoot i don't think i've used that pencil clasp ever but uh you could put a sharpened a broken in half sharpened uh non-photo blue pencil in there and that would be great i have french curves which are more for inking than for sketching. Um, it's to help you pull very clean lines, very clean curved lines. And they come in all sorts of shapes. And what you do is you just kind of um, line up what you're trying to ink with the curve. I have an Ames lettering guide, which is used for um, when you're hand lettering uh, dialogue. Um, and it helps you lay down lines. And I think I have a blog post about using this as well. I don't use these very often anymore because I digitally letter seven inch Kara. Um, then I have a couple of clear rulers and I recommend clear rulers because you can see your lines underneath, although they are a bit flimsy. Um, and here's another small clear ruler. Then I have various templates and these can be useful for um, like drawing ellipses, drawing circles, more ellipses, even more ellipses, right? Those could be useful for drawing um, like word balloons, for example. And last, oh no, second to last, because <laughs> I have another last, second to last are ship's curves, which are like French curves except much bigger. 
and um, they tend to have larger curves than a French curve is capable of. Lastly is a small face mirror, and I'm not going to show my face because I look pretty grungy right now. Um, and this is really good for referencing facial expressions. So if you have room on your desk, you should consider it. And I got this at TJ Maxx. You can get a plastic one at the dollar store. It works just as well. One side is a magnifying mirror. The other side is a regular mirror. So um, I'm going to pause the video and put these things away because I don't have a lot of room on my desk with all of this uh, and get back to you guys. All right. So now... Now you have a basic idea of the tools you're going to need for doing uh, basic roughs. And the point of doing basic roughs is just to tighten up what you've done so it makes visual sense. So I'm going to, even though um, when it comes to figure work, I often draw my figures pretty tight. Oh, where is it? Here it is. Another important tool is a good eraser. Often, several good erasers. Oh, sorry. I've had a headache all day today. And I took medicine, and I ate lunch, and I took a bath, and I did all of the things that normally work, and they're not working. Now I'm just trying to push through because I have a lot of work to get done. I may end up erasing that. We'll see. And I don't always sketch the figure in first. Um, quite often I will draw the background in. Um, but because Naomi is so large in this illustration and the background is pretty close to the, the grid I put down, I'm going to go ahead and put her in first and then draw things around her. Though I am having trouble drawing her today. That leg looks weird. Oh, another handy tool and you usually see it on my desk when I'm recording, is your eraser brush to help keep things kind of clean. Dang it, I might have to get down my craft mat because the glass, the combination of glass and thin, thin paper and soft lead means I am always cracking my leads. That's kind of a waste of money. That's something my own cat, Bowie, insists on doing, is if I'm um, sitting or laying on the ground, he wants to be on top of me. He also wants to be on top of me at my desk, but that makes it very hard to draw. So even if it would be an uncomfortable situation for him, he'll still insist. So that pancake pose is drawn from my own cat's behavior. Does anybody else think that male cats kind of behave more like dogs than female cats do? I've had, oh, I've had a lot of female cats in my life. And they're all, they're all good cats, but they're all a little standoffish, a little aloof. But the one, so the sample size of one here, the one male cat I have is very friendly and outgoing and wants to go outside and wants to walk on a leash and wants to play and I've talked to other owners of male cats and they say their male cats are more like a buddy. A lot of Naomi's cat pancakes behavior is based on my own cat Bowie so and I don't think he's like a strange 
cat. He's definitely not a good hunter at all. Um, he wants to go play outside with the squirrels and be their friend rather than chase after the squirrels and try to eat them. And all of my female cats have been hunters and, you know, will try to bring home, bring in rabbits and stuff. But Bowie just wants to play with them. So I kind of figured if Bowie encountered a tiny person, he would just want to be her friend. Kind of like Pancake just wants to be Kara's friend. And my justification is he's still young. He, um, he has positive associations with the way humans smell because his life has been pretty easy. So, you know, if Kara smells like a human, he's going to think of her the same way he thinks of Naomi. I've also read, though, that cats just basically see humans as, like, big cats. So maybe he just sees Kara as a really tiny cat. Sorry if my head got in the shot. Okay, I can mostly move Naomi reference out of the way. And start marking in the background. So Naomi likes to read, she just moved to the house her dad grew up in and she likes to spend her time outside reading because oh well likes to I should say more like has to she's in honors classes and um, she's doing her summer reading she don't get out of that and when I was her age my I love reading but boy did summer reading really threaten <laughs> threaten any love I had of reading because not only did you have to read the book which was fine but in honors classes in Luling, Louisiana you had to fill out like a 20 page relentless pa quiz type packet um, before for each book and there was usually five to six books for each book before uh, before school started again in August and it would take the whole and this was I mean this all had to be written out by hand too um, and the space provided was usually not adequate to write your answer so you were writing you were attaching like I think I went through like several packages of, of loose leaf paper one summer because we had several thick books anyway I did not enjoy summer reading at all. I liked the reading part. That was, but I read anyway. So it wasn't like it really. And it was never, I think some schools do like graphic novels and stuff, but that never would have flown at Hanville when I was a student 10 billion years ago. So, um, don't have fond associations with summer reading. I'm sure someone has come up with a system that works better, that isn't so painful. I think it was just done the way it was done at the high school I went to because it had been done that way forever, so why change it? So I thought Naomi should have to suffer that little bit of 
And that would be a hard summer because she's just moved houses. She's switching schools. She's got uh, summer reading to try and cram in in the last few weeks of school. Because that's when she transferred. I feel bad for her. Although that's a pretty realistic situation. I'm really, really sorry for the squealing lead. I'm really sorry for myself, too, for all the breaking lead. And this would, um, for more complicated panels, this would take a lot longer. So I think what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to finish sketching in and then I'm going to, so I'm going to come back to you guys when this has been sketched in and uh, I'll start penciling for you guys on camera. Okay, so everything is for the most part sketched out. I'm leaving this part of the page fairly unfilled in because that's where the title information is going to go. But I did try to populate her environment with things that she would be interested in. Like um, there's a soda and a zebra cake and like her notes from her summer reading and her phone and her headphones. Um, because this is an opportunity to give the reader um, information about the character without just handing it to them. And another thing is, uh, while you're still learning how to do this, don't try not to cheat yourself. Try to do as much of your work in this and the thumbnail stage as you possibly can because it's gonna make it a lot easier for you later on because this is the stage that people aren't going to necessarily see. I mean, the only reason you guys are seeing this is because I'm actively showing it to you. Um, if you're a normal reader of my comic, you probably wouldn't ever see this. Um, having all of this top taped around and working at this desk is really annoying. And I also, I use the ruler to, um, to do straight lines and, uh, I guess I will pencil with the straight lines as well. Usually when I'm penciling on watercolor paper, I freehand it at that point, uh, just so that there's a more organic feel to what I'm rendering. But while you're learning how to draw, while you're developing the fine motor skills, I recommend you, you use whatever tools are available to you to help you produce the best product you can. And I really, really don't like drawing on glass because there's just like no give. And if you have to draw things to give yourself additional information, don't worry about that. Um, Again, this is a planning stage, so you do what you need to do to make this readable to you. Or if you're working with a writer who needs who wants to check what you've drawn or an editor, you need to include the information uh, necessary to make the project understandable. And um, don't, in my experience, don't do loose thumbnails and loose roughs assuming you're going to be able to get to them tomorrow because stuff happens um 
chapter five, I thought I was going to be able to knock that out last November. Uh, not 2015, but 2014, yeah. Uh, and stuff just kept happening to keep me from working on it for long periods of time. I mean, even if you make working on your project a priority, something could happen, somebody could get sick. So you want to make sure you draw enough that if you pick this up a year later, you can finish it off. I mean, I really hate drawing on glass. Let me see. I would like to rotate my paper. Um, I think I can remove these now. I think I've got everything I need from them. And I'll reuse my scrap paper over and over again until it either I can't easily tape it to another sheet of paper or uh, it's so covered with lines I can't tell what's going on. And I'll use, if it isn't a printer, like um, printing scrap, paper misprints. I will use both sides of the paper. Not not because I'm using expensive paper, because I'm not. I'm using like the cheapest copy stock that Office De Max sells. Um, but just so that I'm not further, <laughs> I'm not wasting paper. I'm not, you know, killing more trees than I absolutely have to. There are some things I can tweak or um, modify in Photoshop afterwards, but it's just really easiest on me, future me, past me, all me. Uh, it's really just easiest if I do what I can do at this stage instead of, you know, trying to put off. put under this to make it less of a pain. A sketchbook might work. No! Dang it! I need a better... I might need another side table because I've got so much junk going, that builds up. Alright. That should be better, hopefully. Also, drawing on glass, like directly on glass, is really rough on your wrist. Because it means your hand is taking all of the impact. Instead of, like, my sketchbook, which is now taking the impact. So that's a bit better. like how I drew her neck. But see, this is a fine time to fiddle around with that and to, like, work at it until it looks right. And I can also uh, lasso her head in Photoshop and bring it over a little bit.
And when you're first learning how to do perspective, you really want to be as patient with yourself as you possibly can. And it also helps to go outside and or to stay inside and sketch your room. Just draw it. Don't even try to lay down the perspective lines necessarily or to try to recreate scenes from photographs using your perspective grids. Because the more you practice it, the better you're going to get, the more you can eyeball it, the fewer. I'm not, and I'm not saying like eyeballing is like a great thing, but there's a certain amount of eyeballing, a certain amount of best guessing you can do that will um, make the process go faster so you're not trying so many things and failing. And it's better to do that on small pieces or pieces you don't care as much about because then you can just be like, well, this isn't working and you can scrap it if you need to and move on to the next one cause, and apply what you've learned rather than on your comic pages where, you know, you need it to work out. So you're going to have to keep pushing. And I don't consider doing it in um, Manga Studio or in Photoshop to be cheating. I think those are great tools. I just, like I said, I just wanted to show you guys the way that anybody with paper, pencils, some tape, and a couple of rulers, anybody can do that. You don't need to pay for software. Because while I disagree that any art material is going to be good enough, you know, um, I do feel like there isn't a good excuse to not draw comics today if you want to learn how to draw comics. Because, I mean, I'm doing these roughs on the, just, like, the cheapest paper. And, I mean, I am using a nice mechanical pencil. But for years, I used a clear point from Walmart with the same kind of lead in it, actually. I'm using Pentel High Polymer in a B because it marks over... Uh, the non-photo blue really well and my scanner picks it up and like you could even if you're just practicing you could even stop your comic at this stage like it doesn't have to be super polished or super finished it might even be better if it's less polished and less finished while you're learning because you're less you're spending less time per page so you can move, you can potentially move faster and try more things I mean I wouldn't recommend a watercolor comic for example for somebody who's just getting started because there's so much involved in that and there's really very little early reward and um, it just takes so much work to get anywhere with it that it's probably better if you I'm going to fix his mouth later, I think. Uh, it's probably better if you get started with something that's very low investment, like pencil on copier paper. Or Bristol, or cheap cardstock. I mean, um, they're not going to look... They, they won't be as archival, and um, they might get damaged more easily, but pretty much any cheap printer is now a three-in-one. So you can easily scan your pages. There's no reason for, when you're just learning, for your original to be the only copy you have. And if you don't know what something looks like, um, and you probably, you probably don't, like, um, I'm probably going to end up re-referencing these when I tighten up my watercolor pencils later on, um, like the soda can or the zebra cake or the cake box, right? 
Um, if you don't know, if you know what something looks like, if you don't think you know what something looks like, please reference it. There is zero, I know we've talked about this and I'll talk about this forever. Um, there is zero shame in referencing things. The people who should be ashamed are the ones who make fun of you for referencing things or call it cheating. Because they clearly don't know what they're talking about. And that doesn't just go for comics. That's like any kind of art. If you want to become an animator, um, like Disney, for example, Disney Studios, they would send their artists out on field trips to the zoo and they'd bring models in and they would go on trips and fill sketchbooks of what? Of reference material, of learning how to draw a particular thing. So there is nothing wrong with needing to look something up. Not everybody, ha most people don't actually have photographic memory. I don't care what some of them claim. They are not above referencing. And um, another, I showed you that little hand mirror earlier. Another thing those are useful for are referencing hands. And if you have a phone with a camera, you can, man, my, my camera phone is like my biggest tool, honestly. I'm probably going to be taking all of my reference photos for this chapter with my smartphone because I can upload them to Google Drive very easily and I can access them on my computer for a larger size uh, view or I can ha keep them on my phone and work on them if I'm traveling places without having to pull out a computer. Like, I mean, smartphones are great. You can Google reference very easily on your smartphone. I do it at cons for characters all the time. I mean, really, uh, a smartphone or a camera phone should be right up there, in my opinion, with like pencil and paper for comics. But you can do comics without them, and people have done comics without them for almost 100 years. Longer if you want to count, um, like Japanese woodblock prints as being proto comics, or illuminate, illuminated manuscripts as being proto comics, or altar pieces as being proto comics, which a lot of people do consider those to be. So, in that case, people have been using, uh, have been working without the internet to make their, their comics, their sequential art for a really long time. But if you want to be uh, kind of pedantic about it and a bit of a jerk um, then you know we've been people did comics without smartphones for about a hundred years and if you're gonna scan this and drop the blue lines leaving only the the, the black like the graphite you really want to make sure you you work as clean as you possibly can. That's why I'm going in and erasing certain things so that I can tell very easily what's what later. Because there's really no point in spending your time doing blue lines or roughs if you aren't going to use them later. If you're going to just like dash them out so quickly that they can't, they don't mean anything to you later and you have to redraw the whole thing. I mean, my goal with this stage is when I print these out onto um, watercolor paper, I'm just tightening things up, maybe fixing the nose, maybe adding some detail to the eyes, but I'm not messing with the perspective. Um, that's the goal. Whereas with thumbnails, I really just wanted to get figures on the paper, compositions, placement. And some artists, um, they'll, at this stage, they'll go ahead and they'll block in things that should be pure black, 
like like the interior of the box might be an example or like parts of that window I'm not because this is watercolor and there's very little about it that's going to be pure black I'm sorry if I'm blocking y'all's view. I'm about to move my hand. Sometimes it's funny to me how different, um, the roughs and the finished page actually look I mean sometimes they look like they're diff drawn by different artists just because so much is different in the finished page the color really makes a big difference the watercolor textures really make a big difference adding lettering uh, covers up some things even though I do try to accommodate for lettering I am kind of a wordy writer so uh, it's hard for me to to juggle the two. I mean, I think what stops a lot of people from drawing and putting the time in is like this fear of failure. And um, any artist you can think of has failed even if it's only in their own eyes or made mistakes or created something they were really unhappy with more times than you'll know um, and we're kind of discouraged from talking about our failures publicly um, which I think is kind of a shame but not everything everybody does is perfect and you should just because you're struggling right now doesn't mean you should give up I mean, I was not good at all in high school or in undergrad or in the beginning of grad school. And I'm probably still, like in 10 years time, I'm going to look at how I drew now and I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she did videos and stuff. But that's, that's between me and myself. You know, I want, I want more from my life. I want to get better. So I'm putting the time in. And sharing it with you guys, like that's been a constant through all of my artistic growth is I've always been very interested in sharing things that I learned or sharing my mistakes with other people. And that opens me up for criticism and ridicule and I've gotten both of those. Um, but. I would like to think at some point in my future it would open me up for um, relationships with other artists, you know, based on being a human who can be vulnerable sometimes. But just because I've had negative experiences doesn't, I mean, it does affect me, it does make me sad, but it doesn't mean I'm going to just like quit doing something that I love or something that I care about. Because most of those people, if, most of the people who are going to say something ugly about what you're doing, it doesn't have anything to do with the, you, it has everything to do with them. Um, And then, if it is someone whose opinion you do actually care about, it still probably doesn't have much to do with you. It probably has more to do with them. But you also need to, to ask yourself if they have your best interests in terms of improvement and growth at heart. And if they do, um, or if what they're saying is something that's, that's valid and something you can actually remedy, then you need to take it seriously. Um, but sometimes, sometimes people who love you don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I 
and sometimes they like to seem like they know what they're talking about, but they don't. I mean, if somebody is saying you need to practice more, they're, they're probably right. We can all benefit from more study and more work. Um, or if they point out, like, you know, you need to get better at figure drawing, again, that's probably a valid, a valid critique because they can actually point out um, an area for improvement, but if they just say things like, well, you're never going to get good at this, you know, n no one in our family is an artist, I don't know why you think you're going to be one, stuff like that, um, it hurts, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt, but it isn't valid either, you can just do your best to ignore that, and like I said, I know, I know it hurts, I know it's hard to ignore that kind of being talked to like that by somebody who ow, you love or admire or whose approval you want um, and you're just going to have to push through it if you really want this to be something done. Now I'm just kind of like blocking in where the bricks are going to be because that's going to make painting this page a lot easier. And then the last step I would have is the chapter cover, the chapter information. Okay, so that is the rough. Oh, yeah. I thought I hadn't drawn in her hair because it looks so, um, it's so unfilled in compared to the busyness of the brick wall, but in the watercolor, the brick wall is going to be much less busy, and her hair is black, so, um, I think she'll stand out pretty well against the background, although her kitty might get lost, but I don't think so. Okay, so that was the rough for the chapter cover for 7-inch Kara Chapter 6, um, if you found this helpful, if you found this useful, if you like what I had to say, please leave a like, uh, leave a comment, share with your friends, and consider subscribing to my channel. This is one video of many on my process for doing a watercolor comic, so I recommend you check out my other videos if you haven't. I hope you guys have a good day. Bye!